The Republican Party considered Virginia a jewel in their crown. Virginia is a southern state. It's a conservative state by and large, especially, you know, west of Richmond. Ignored in previous election, all of a sudden, the, the 13 electoral votes, you know, people began to look at. We need those 13 votes. Virginia, your voice can change the world tomorrow. This is indeed the most important election of my lifetime. Are you fired up? Are you ready to go? Virginia is going to matter this year. Commonwealth of Virginia is a battleground state. We it's must definitely a battleground state. Virginia, let's go change the world. I don't know who's going to win. Um, my name is Melinda Lewis. I'm the Loudoun County Field Director for the McCain Paling Campaign. Yeah, go ahead and just take him. I think after the YouTube debates in November, I was really, really passionate about McCain. Senator McCain has the experience to handle the situations uh, that the world poses. Right now, I would have to say the candidate uh, that most small businesses would support would be John McCain. I mean, I, I'm looking into what Obama's policies are, and, and to me, it looks like socialism. Yeah. about Sarah Palin. I mean, we loved McCain too, especially the fact that he's pro-life. I love that she's a woman and she has spitfire and she's just, I saw her speech and it was like amazing. She's beautiful, you know, and nobody heard about her. Only the, she appeared like an angel, you know, that's what I felt. She demonstrated as governor of Alaska that she has a great deal of administrative ability. She's got five kids and anybody that can manage being a governor and having five kids, I mean, Quite frankly, I think that she can do anything. On November 4th, 2008, Sarah Palin and John McCain couldn't carry Virginia. A majority of white voters cast their ballot for the Republican ticket, but that wasn't enough. The Democrats have realized that in the last few election cycles, women can make the difference. Northern Virginia women came out very strongly for Obama. I certainly agree that Northern Virginia has gone more Democratic. You know, as a proud resident of Oakton, Virginia, I can tell you that the Democrats have just come in from the District of Columbia and moved into Northern Virginia, and that's really what you see there. But the rest of the state, uh, real Virginia, if you will, I think will be very responsive to Senator McCain's message. Are we in real Virginia? We are not in the real Virginia. When somebody asks me where I'm from, I say the D.C. metro area. I grew up in the South, so I have, I, I think that there is an aspect of me that is a Southern woman, but it certainly does not come from living in Northern Virginia. We're infiltrated. Lots more people came in, and that's changed it. Northern Virginia is majority non-Virginian. I grew up here in Virginia, the same house, since I stepped um, into the, the soil of the U.S. Uh, my name is Rosa Mirabile. Uh, I used to be Garcia. This is Orlando Sarbuche. He's been with us for almost what, 18 years. I came from Cuba 1966. Uh, we opened in 1969, and it was the first Spanish tour in Crossland. We have Argentina sauces. We have the Salvadorian and Mexican. Within Northern Virginia, Arlington County is particularly multicultural. In Virginia, we were never accepted as contributors to this society. In Arlington County, yes. In Arlington County, it's an exceptional county where we value diversity. That's one of the great things about being in Arlington is uh, um, being gay, being lesbian isn't, isn't an anomaly. You know, our daughter's at school and she's got two moms and the kids don't seem, don't seem to care, so. One thing that we all have to learn from Arlington is Virginia and the nation will look like Arlington. 
with the changing composition of the state, what defines a Virginia woman today? A Virginia woman is a spirited woman who thinks her own thoughts and follows through with them. Virginia women have found a way to rewrite their state's political agenda, even when they couldn't vote. The government extended voting rights after the Civil War, but not for women. So the powers that be, and at the time the powers that be were all kind of white men, looked out and thought, you know, black men deserved it more than any woman. Our grandmother um, was an, an early suffragist. When she was 20 years old, her parents divorced, and this caused an enormous scandal. Her mother was left with absolutely no money and no help of any kind. She was stunned to find that her mother had no rights. Now, the period of time is 1917. World War I is active. President Wilson is in the White House, and he's refusing to even consider the suffrage amendment. We have been imprisoned in the worst of conditions, fed rotten gruel, no soap, forced to shower in front of male guards, beaten with chains, force-fed if we refuse to eat. This is the conditions your sisters are suffering in to petition for the vote. At the time, the thought was that women wouldn't bother to register, that just as many women opposed it as wanted it. But that wasn't true. Women did come out, even though they had to register as Mrs. George Smith or something, not by their own names. Virginia women continue to register in record numbers. African-American women alone make up 10% of Virginia voters, enough to determine the recent election. A stunning result given Virginia's past. Race has a long, long history in Virginia. Slavery and racial uh, exploitation has left a legacy. They used to have bathrooms, white ladies, colored women. <laughs> and I went home and told my mother, Mama, I said, the bathroom with the doors, one saying white ladies and colored women. And my mother said, well, you know, the Bible never spoke of ladies. <laughs> the Bible <laughs> spoke of women. Well, they decided that the little black children were not eligible and they were not supposed to go in the pool. And um, it was heartbreaking for us not to be able to go in a beautiful, beautiful pool. All the older people would just say, oh, well, that's mm -hmm. what it's been said. That's the way it's supposed to be. Not to me. And so I remember, uh, rather than integrated, they took a bulldozer and filled it with dirt. We're talking about the state where the capital of the Confederacy was here, Richmond. We're talking about the state that still reveres Robert E. Lee. I remember the first time I came to Virginia and I saw a, a Confederate flag on someone's car. I almost crashed my car. I thought, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> no, you've got to be kidding. It was just a shock to me. I can remember the date, 1999. And my hair done, nails done, and my husband had given me this gorgeous fur coat. So here I am with, thinking I'm feeling good, looking good, and I walk in and see this empty seat, and I sit in this seat. And um, there was a lady struggling with her ermine next to me, and I kind of helped her get it off, and, and she thanked me, and we were all looking at the big screen. And, and as the ceremony concluded, uh, there were refreshments, and I decided to, oh, I'd love a cup of tea. So I got up to go near to get a cup of tea, and this gentleman had said to me, he was standing there too, oh. And he says to me, conversation, I saw you sitting next to Mrs. So-and-so. Are you her maid? I grew up in Memphis. Um, I was five when Dr. King was shot. The, the idea that, that, that we could have a black president and that my kids will see it, I, it just, it just, thrills me in a way that also surprises me. I didn't realize how viscerally I would feel about this. And, and um, I think our children right now are relatively race blind. If you walk into a room of people, people see you first as a woman or as an African-American. 
And I could always say it was African American before a woman. But today, things are changing and evolving. But people still see a woman, and a woman is different. You can't learn what it is to be a woman unless you are one. You can't have a government devoid of women that knows what's best for women. And you can't legislate for women without women. When you understand that there have been over 11,000 men who have served in Congress since the country's founding, and only 240 women, you, it, it stops you, only fewer than 2%. And that, by the way, is the same, it's mirrored in the Virginia state history as well. Women weren't allowed to be members of the Democratic Party, either party, Democratic or Republican. Mm -hmm. Only men could be party members, so the women had to form an auxiliary and it was those women auxiliaries, the people involved in that, that then uh, eventually became the, the heart and soul of the league. Well, the, the point is women don't run. And I don't, we need some training ground, so to speak. Hillary Clinton is an interesting case because she played by all the numbers. The women have to sort of outperform in order to get picked for the team. Hillary Clinton did that. Sarah Palin's more interesting because she runs totally against type. She is the, the anti-Hillary in many ways, uh, claiming a status of feminist that's completely foreign and different to the status of feminism that Hillary actually had to claim only very tenuously. In Virginia, some women bristled at any comparison of Sarah Palin to Hillary Clinton, while other women held up a mirror to Sarah Palin and saw a part of themselves reflected back. She said the difference between an ice hockey mom and a pit bull was lipstick. What is an ice hockey mom? Someone that devotes her life to hockey and her kids and that, them having fun on the ice. The fact that Sarah Palin has taken herself from basically us yes, but to me. where she is, um, I, I and think mayor, is And mayor in Alaska is more like, um, you know, room mom. And then to the governor and, I mean, if, when, when they announced her and I said, are you kidding, a mom who is, is showing us that, that you can have a, a career and, and be, um, and ha still have your kids and, and be a powerhouse and take on legislatures. But the political spotlight is harsh at such heights, even more so for female candidates. Today, with blogs and the media, it's a whole new ballgame when you run. It's not so much about substance, it's about the peripheral, about uh, what you might look like, what you don't look like, if you're acceptable in your looks, if you're acceptable in how you act as a woman. I'll, I'll, I'll paint a picture for you. A uh, senior person in our local party asked me to meet at a bar to talk about things, and I thought we were there'd been some tension and I thought we were gonna kind of start with a clean plate and talk about how we were gonna work together to make sure I got elected, I was the candidate. And instead, um, I frankly got um, yelled at in public and to the point where some of the people in the bar were telling us to be quiet. And it was unacceptable behavior. Uh, I do not think that if I was a man that would have happened. We hear a lot now that women can do anything they choose to do, uh, can attain, obtain any office. Um, I don't believe that. I think we still have a way to go. My husband and I both work full time and you, know, you climb the ladder and you hit a certain point that it becomes clear. You recognize that you know, showing your kids you can work and, and be the leader in your nonprofit or wherever you work is uh, what the message you want to get across to them. But it's a trade-off, and you can't do both. For years, we've heard Republicans say, you know, women can't have young children and still have careers and uh, lead, have offices and this type of thing. And the moment Sarah Palin came on the scene, that was over. That was done. And you've heard, you know, Democrats saying, you can have children and you can still, you know, run for office. And the moment she came on, I heard some Democrats, not many, but some saying, she should be home with that baby. Any breastfeeding woman knows 
that you can't breastfeed and be on the campaign trail at the same time. It just doesn't work. So true moms out there all know that this is a sham. To hear Sarah Palin call herself a feminist is offensive. Yeah. I feel she doesn't even know what it is. I know feminists. Sarah Palin, you're no feminist. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah Palin inspired a similar reaction for many Democratic women in Virginia, primarily because of her adamant pro-life beliefs. When I was in college, I knew young women who were getting back alley abortions or doing it themselves with knitting needles. My emotional attachment to choice is through my sister, who was three years older than me. I'm 60, and she uh, became pregnant summer out of high school. And in 1963, there's no choice. You're pregnant, there's no choice. So Patty married um, this man and stayed married to him through her life and had a very difficult life. Uh, su suffered eating disorders. She died when she was 39. The most central issue to women, whether you are conservative or liberal, Democrat or Republican, is reproduction. Our political structure doesn't have a way to sort of work it into our understandings of what, what the public is, what government's role should be. What's more emotional than a baby? Um, what's more emotional than getting pregnant? My sister had a baby when she was 16, and she was adamant about being pro-life and giving her daughter a chance. And her daughter's seven now, and she's the most amazing little girl. Once I have a family, once I have a daughter who is, is disabled, I look at life as precious, precious to the eye of God. I want the debate has become more complex. I'm a Democratic woman who's actually anti-abortion. And so when I talk to my Republican friends who are also um, anti-abortion, what I say is if we only talk about life and choice, if the only two words we ever say is life and choice, then we've already missed the boat. Well, I also consider myself an evangelical Christian. I have a very strong belief in, in Jesus Christ. And I think just outlying abortions is not the answer. Am I not going to talk to you because you're pro-choice? No. Am I not, am I going to judge you if you've had an abortion? No. It's a personal issue and I think that it's been brought too much to the government's hands. It really should just be a, it's a health issue and it's a, I, I don't, I, I wish it had not come to the forefront of, of politics because it's, it's one of the most divisive issues. Yes. Virginia women were divided on many issues. Our premium went up to $1,700 a month. And so we decided um, we, we did go ahead and um, cut off our insurance plan. But for my daughter, um, it was Virginia Medicaid that you know, helps pay for her medical bills, things like that. Socialized medicine is not going to cure it. It hasn't cured it yet. Medicaid hasn't cured it yet. So you can't make it bureaucratic and make it better. 14 million Latinos do not have uh, health insurance. Latina women are saying, we are a force. We have been working very hard for our families. We want the best for our families. We cannot be silent anymore. It's nice, warm, and fuzzy to say, yeah, everybody is entitled to health care, but no one's discussing what that means and what it means to the doctors, what it means to patients' care, choice in care, choice of doctors. If I have to go out and you have to go out and procure our own health care, people like me, not only with my history of cancer, but my current normal aging issues, to assume that I as an individual have the clout to be able to negotiate a plan, to get coverage first of all, to get it at an affordable price, and to negotiate as an individual um, is folly. The Pentagon is situated in Virginia, in Arlington. When it was hit, local responders had to come from Arlington police and fire. 
I was uh, dropping my daughter off at preschool. So I was walking home, and I obviously didn't have a radio or anything, and I'm hearing sirens. Every window in the house shook, and uh, the, dog, the dogs went berserk. They were barking, they, they sensed something, and then you heard it. You heard just this huge explosion, and you could smell the jet fuel. What we saw with Bill Clinton was he was trying all the ways not to have a war with the terrorists. I mean, they, they struck the coal, they, they bombed our embassy, and you know we, we didn't have a plan that was big against terrorism. And then we got 9-11. The single issue that I'm very upset about is the war. And I want us out of Iraq. I would like to see America win that war and come home victorious. Get out of this house. We are now spending about $2 billion a month in Iraq. Conservatively, this war is going to cost us a trillion dollars. I have one friend that has gone over there, but as far as, um, I guess, our, in general, the foreign policy that's making the soldiers go over there, I'm not really sure that I agree with that. It's not that I love war. I mean, it sounds like, and that's what, that's no, what a lot I, of I times the Republican or conservative point of view is forced to, to be defending war. Who, nobody wants war. We need to, to you know, end the war responsibly and safely, but start investing in our people and in our country. Virginia has a very strong tradition, a military tradition. The tradition goes way back beyond the Civil War. Uh, it's a high value is placed on service to the country, patriotism. Eight. He's a VCU student. She was in the National Guard and like everyone else, signed up to get college tuition and then found herself deployed. There is nothing wrong with a woman who has children, a mother, wanting to volunteer and serve her country. But she also is volunteering to serve in the National Guard, which serves one weekend a month and two weeks out of the year. When our commander in chief reorganizes the military structure and takes mothers away from their home for one, two, even three deployments at a time, they begin to lose touch with their family, with their relationships, and that's not what they originally signed on for. The gas price situation over the summer was uh, sort of, I think, the start of it. This September's job report confirmed what we most feared, that we have now had nine consecutive months of job losses. I'm selling a lot of uh, so-called foreclosures. And it's so sad to see people lost their homes. And this is uh, the foundation of a family. For myself as a business owner and having to be held accountable for everything that I do, I think that the bailout, being that um, these gentlemen and CEOs are out getting manicures, pedicures, and massages, and spending thousands and thousands of dollars after they've just been bailed out is totally inappropriate. And I, ha I have a lot of hard feelings about that. If my business were to fail, I can't call anyone to bail me out. I think for this election, it's the economy, stupid. <laughs> 8753, Copeland, on court, People started showing up about 5.30, and we're in line, and the line was down to the highway. It has been a buzz of activity all day long. I have never experienced anything like this, and it feels very, very good. It is 6.45 in the night of the election, so uh, polls close in like 15 minutes. Lines are probably still out the door. They've been like that all day. I have always liked the, the whole aspect of doing something that can make a difference in the world. We're up, we're out, we're voting, and this feels fantastic across the board. I don't care who you are. I don't care your party, I don't care your gender, I don't care your color. This is good for America. And CNN can now project that Barack Obama, 47 years old, will become the president-elect of the United States. Well, when the election results came in and the room just went up, you know, Obama is now our 44th president, and we, I mean, the room just exploded. He gives me so much hope for the future. Whoever's in the presidency is my president. People were crying and hugging and such, and my, my oldest son looked at me and he said, Mommy, you're not crying. He does not let himself get ruffled. 
and he re retains his dignity. Obama brings a fresh new light. A couple days later, I'm driving down Constitution Avenue in Washington, D.C., and there's a place in Constitution.